All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Liz and I am from Reach. I'm also an HD mom. And so I'm really excited that you guys can um, participate today. We have the, um, well, I think amazing Dr. Jack Langer here with us, who is a pediatric surgeon with Toronto Sick Kids and also a member of our Reach board and um, definitely our go to with Hirschsprung's related questions. And so what's going to happen is Dr. I'm going to flip this over to Dr. Langer. And then afterwards, we will open up to question and answer period through chat. And so yes, just so happy that you guys could be with us today. Dr. Langer. Great. So everybody can hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to give a, a presentation about uh, today's topic, which is what happens uh, after the pull through um, and everything is recovered, but then the child doesn't necessarily have the kind of outcome you were hoping for. So this is about uh, longer term problems after uh, a pull through uh, in children with Hirschsprungs. So just, I wanted to start by just um, reviewing what the different operations are for Hirschsprungs disease. Uh, because some of the complications or issues that we're going to talk about are specific to a particular operation. And um, there are three main operations that are done. Um, there isn't any good evidence that one is necessarily better than the other. It's really what the surgeon has been trained to do and what they do regularly. And that's the operation that your child should have. <clears throat> the original operation was the Swenson operation. And that's really where the rectum that has no nerve cells, no ganglion cells is removed. And the normal bowel that has normal nerves <clears throat> is sewn just above the anal sphincter. The goal of the operation, of course, is to remove the non-functioning bowel without nerve cells and bring the normal bowel down, but at the same time, preserving continence, um, preserving control by not interfering with the sphincter muscles at the bottom. <clears throat> so that's the Swenson operation, which is widely done, especially in North America nowadays. It's very simple. You remove the bad bowel, bring the good bowel down, and sew it just above the sphincters. The, the, what used to be called the Suave operation is now the Yancey Suave, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, what, what that operation does is remove the lining of the rectum that has no nerve cells, but leaving the muscle behind. And the reason that was developed was really a safety thing in the old days. Um, where doing surgery way down deep in a child's pelvis could be pretty risky. So in the, in the Yancey Suave, the, the um, lining of the rectum is removed, the muscle stays behind, and the normal bowel is brought down and sewn just above the sphincter muscles. The reason that Yancey was added is that um, Asa Yancey was a black surgeon back in the middle of the 20th century who actually uh, invented this operation, uh, but because black surgeons weren't allowed to publish in mainstream journals, uh, his operation was published in a, in a journal that was only for black surgeons and wasn't widely recognized. Uh, Franco Soave was an Italian surgeon who, <clears throat> who also described the same operation, but 10 years later, and his name became associated with that operation. And in recent years, uh, Yancey's contribution has now been recognized, and so uh, most of us are are now calling this the Yancey Soave operation. The Duhamel operation is a little bit different, and that's where the um, abnormal rectum that does not have nerve cells is left behind, usually just a short segment of this rectum, and the normal bowel is brought down and connected to this rectum, um, usually at the back. Um, and usually using a stapling device. So at the bottom, the normal bowel that has normal, normal stripping peristalsis <clears throat> goes right down to the bottom, but the uh, native rectum, the one that doesn't have nerve cells, is still there. Um, this operation is done by some surgeons in North America, but is, um, is more popular in, uh, in the UK and, and uh, some other countries. So when I was uh, training in pediatric surgery in the 1980s, I was taught that um, if the operation is done properly, that every child with Hirschsprung disease will have a great result. It was really like plumbing, where you remove the abnormal left bowel, bring the good bowel down, everybody should be fine. <laughs> but um, as people started doing better long-term follow-up, 
of these patients, um, it became clear that that's not always the case. Um, it is still true that that most children uh, who have a good operation for Hirschsprung disease have a very good outcome without a lot of problems. But but many children do still have problems, especially early on for the first four or five years. Um, and so what I'm going to do in the rest of this little talk is to go through the, the really the two types of problems that kids can have after their pull through. The first one is that they have persistent obstructive symptoms. You know, kids with Hirschsprung's, when they first present, whether they're a newborn or, or they're a little bit older, they have obstruction because that bowel at the bottom without nerve cells doesn't push the stool down. And so they, they have obstruction, whether it's constipation or just a full-blown bowel obstruction. And some kids continue to have these kind of obstructive symptoms after their pull through. And that can be ongoing constipation. It can be ongoing distension and blockages. <clears throat> um, and in some kids, they get enterocolitis, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about today because that's really a whole other topic on its own. But um, many of these kids will also develop inflammation in their, um, in their bowel, even after they've had a pull through. And then the second kind of problem that these kids can have is soiling. And sometimes they have a combination of these two. So I'm going to go one after the other and start by talking about the persistent obstructive symptoms. And the thing I'm going to try and underline here uh, is that we need, as doctors and nurses and parents, to try and understand what the cause of these problems is in an individual patient. Um, and we need to have an organized approach to figuring that out. <clears throat> and this is what I try and teach other surgeons, what I teach my residents, and what I'm today teaching you, the families of these kids. So let's talk about obstruction first. Uh, there are really five causes of obstructive symptoms in a child after a pull through. The first one is just mechanical obstruction. And I'm going to show you some examples of, of problems that can result in mechanical obstruction to the bowel. This, this is a stricture, which is usually as, as the bowel heals, as the operation heals, there's scar tissue that forms and narrows down the opening. And in this case, this is a severe um, <clears throat> example of it where it's just this little tiny opening here. But this is something that can be identified by, by the doctor doing a rectal exam um, or doing a contrast enema like, like you see here. Um, and, and strictures can sometimes be dilated. Um, sometimes we can inject some steroid into the stricture and dilate it and, and get it to open up that way. Um, but sometimes it needs a, a repeat pull through if, it's, uh, if it doesn't respond to dilating. This is another um, problem that can happen. Remember on the Yancey, oper Yancey Suave operation, we leave behind the muscle of the bowel that didn't have ganglion cells at the bottom. And sometimes that muscle can roll down um, and can constrict the pull-through bowel. So this is the pull-through here, and this is where it's kind of constricted by that muscle cuff. And that problem usually requires um, some kind of revision of the pull-through or redo of the pull-through. Um, this is another potential cause of mechanical obstruction after the Duhamel operation. And you remember, we leave the rectum behind that doesn't have the nerve cells and pull the normal bowel down behind it and then join these these two together and in this case the joining didn't go high enough and this <clears throat> um, piece of rectum that uh, doesn't have ganglion cells filled up with stool and because it can't empty because it doesn't have ganglion cells um, it just gets bigger and bigger and pushes on the pull through bowel behind it so this is a problem that would require surgery to either complete this connection here or just remove this uh, abnormal piece of rectum. So these are all examples of, uh, of a mechanical obstruction. And here's one last example. Sometimes during the pull through, if the surgeon isn't careful enough, then, then the bowel can twist <clears throat> on its way down. And you can see that here, that there's a twist in this bowel. And, and that would require um, a revision of the pull through as well. So the second thing that can happen uh, is that the bowel that is brought down and we try during the operation to make sure that it has normal nerve cells in it, 
we want to go up high enough that we have normal bowel that we're pulling down. But sometimes um, it that doesn't happen. Um, this is an example of, of a child. This looks just like Hirschsprung disease. It's narrower at the bottom where there's no nerve cells and it's dilated above. Um, and there's several different things that can happen. One is that the pathologist, when we're doing the original pull through, um, we always ask the pathologist to look at the specimen using what's called a frozen section um, and tell us, do we have a normal nerve cell when we pull that piece of bowel down? And sometimes the pathologist can make an error. Uh, frozen sections are more difficult to uh, evaluate, and sometimes the pathologist may not have enough experience, or that just it's an honest error where they say there are ganglion cells, but there are not. Um, sometimes the bowel that's in between the completely abnormal bowel and the completely normal bowel, there's an area called the transition zone, and sometimes we do the biopsy of that, the pathologist says, yeah, there's nerve cells there, and it wasn't a mistake. They actually do see nerve cells there, and we do the pull through with that, but that's not normal nerve cells, and um, so what we look for in this uh, here is is these what we call hypertrophic nerves. I don't know if you can see that here, but this is one of the findings we would see <clears throat> in a patient who'd had a transition zone pull through, and it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally the operation is done perfectly well. The Pathologist finds completely normal uh, nerves, but for whatever reason, those nerves disappear after the pull through is done. We don't know why that happens, and it's not very common, but it does happen sometimes. And the way we can determine in a child who's got persistent obstructive symptoms um, whether the pathology is normal is to do another rectal biopsy. So, um, a child comes in with obstructive symptoms, we make sure there's no mechanical obstruction by doing the rectal exam and the contrast enema. And we will usually put that child to sleep um, briefly and do another rectal biopsy to make sure that the ganglion cells are normal and the pathology is normal. The third cause <clears throat> for obstructive symptoms is that the bowel that has normal ganglion cells on pathology may not be functioning normally, and we don't know why that happens. Um, and we can evaluate for that using one of several tests. This is a, a nuclear medicine, uh, what we call colon transit study, where the child uh, drinks some milk that has this radio label in it, and then we follow it through the intestinal tract. And we, we know what the normal transit is of that tracer and and we look to see to make sure that it all gets to the bottom the way it's supposed to. If the colon is not pushing normally, um, if there's, in other words, abnormal motility, then the tracer won't get to the bottom in the amount of time it was supposed to. Um, there's a more sophisticated way of doing this, and that's called colonic manometry, where we can actually measure the contractions in the colon all the way from one end to the other. And we look for um, an abnormality. And in this case, this is what it normally looks like. You can see these contractions going from, from uh, top to bottom in the colon there. This is a normal thing. But then at the bottom here, they're all contracting at the same time, um, and it's not progressing the stool forward. So colonic manometry is an excellent way of, of evaluating the motility in the bowel. It's not available at many centers. Um, that's the only problem with it. So a lot of times we'll start by screening with the nuclear study I showed you before. And then if that's abnormal, um, then if there's no colonic manometry where your child is being cared for, then they should be referred to a place that does have the colonic manometry. This is uh, probably the most common reason why some kids continue to have obstructive symptoms. And that is that the anal sphincter in children with Hirschsprung disease is missing the relaxation reflex. Normally, if, if you blow up a balloon in a, in a normal rectum, the internal anal sphincter should relax as a reflex. You don't have control over that. And it makes sense because when the rectum gets full of stool, you want the sphincter to relax so you can get rid of that stool. All kids with Hirschsprung's disease are missing that relaxation. And, this, and you can measure that using anorectal manometry. So this is what the sphincter pressure looks like. And then at this point, 
they blow up a balloon in the rectum to stretch the rectum and you get this reflex relaxation. That's a normal, what's called a rare rectoanal inhibitory reflex. Um, in kids with Hirschsprung disease, um, they don't have that relaxation response. In fact, sometimes they get a little bit of tightening of the sphincter when they blow up the balloon. So some children with Hirschsprung disease are have trouble pushing the stool out through that non-relaxing sphincter. Um, some kids don't have a problem with that, and that's one of the big mysteries that we face in Hirschsprung disease, why they're all missing their, their reflex. None of them can relax their sphincter normally, but only some of the kids have problems because of that. So what can you do about that? Well, in the old days, surgeons would often cut the sphincter muscle, which certainly relaxes it, but that's a, a long-term solution. This, once you've cut the sphincter muscle, it's cut. Um, and, and many of the kids who have this problem with internal sphincter achalasia, they actually get better over time. And I'm going to keep emphasizing that uh, to you because it, it is a problem that gets better over time. They, they don't, they can't relax their sphincter over time, but they can learn how to overcome the non-relaxing sphincter. So cutting the muscle um, to me never seemed like the right thing to do because it could increase the chance that the child will have soiling when when you've cut their sphincter muscle. So um, many years ago, we started using Botox, uh, which most people have heard of for, you know, for relaxing the little tiny muscles in the skin of your face to, to get rid of wrinkles. Um, but it's a very good way of, of relaxing a muscle in a reversible way. So the Botox always wears off after about three months usually. Um, so <clears throat> we, we learned how to um, inject Botox into the sphincter muscle of kids with Hirschsprung disease who were having problems with, uh, with distension and constipation and obstruction um, after their pull through. And there's several different ways this is helpful. The first one is if you give, it's a diagnostic test. If you give Botox and the child improves, if their constipation gets better, their enterocolitis gets less frequent, then it tells us that the non-relaxing sphincter is a large part of this child's problem. This is the kind of organized approach I was talking about before. If it works and then it wears off as it usually does, you can keep repeating the Botox treatments <clears throat> until the child gets old enough to grow out of the problem and you haven't permanently damaged their sphincter muscle. Um, and so we use this very often in kids who, who are having obstructive symptoms. We make sure they don't have a mechanical problem, like I said before. We do a biopsy to check to make sure the pathology is okay. And then we give them a Botox injection to see if that helps. And if it does, then we can keep giving it until they've grown out of the problem. The, the last cause for obstructive symptoms after a pull through is the child holding the stool in themselves. And this is a very common thing among children without Hirschsprung disease. Uh, many, many children around the age of two, three, four, um, as they're going through the toilet training process are learning how to hold the stool in. And sometimes they get into this cycle where they have a hard stool that's painful. Um, their little two-year-old brain says, whoa, that hurt. I'm never doing that again. So they hold it in, hold it in, hold it in. And then they end up having to pass their stool and it hurts again. And it's just a vicious cycle. Um, kids with Hirschsprung disease, um, I think are a little more likely to develop that because of the non-relaxing sphincter, which tends to predispose them to having constipation. And so once you've ruled out all of these other causes of obstruction, we usually end up with, okay, this is probably stool holding behavior. And the best treatment for that um, is pelvic floor physical therapy, which in recent years, we've had way more experience with and, and it, it can be extremely helpful to uh, get these kids through this. So um, I don't know if this shows up well on your computer, but this is the algorithm that we came up with. Um, and I'm just gonna go through it just briefly because I've said everything already that's in here. So a child comes in with obstructive symptoms after their pull through. We do a rectal exam and a contrast enema. 
um, to make sure there's no mechanical obstruction. If there is a mechanical obstruction, then we have to deal with that either by dilating it or doing a redo pull through or, or something like that. If there's no mechanical obstruction, then we do a rectal biopsy. And if the biopsy shows an abnormality in the pathology, most of the time we're going to redo that pull through. Although, you know, sometimes, sometimes we don't if the obstructive symptoms aren't that bad. If the rectal biopsy is normal, then we try a Botox injection. And if the Botox injection improves them, it suggests that it's the non-relaxing sphincter that's the culprit. And we can keep giving the Botox as long as we need to. And usually we can stop giving it by the time they're four or five years old, which is around the time they tend to get better from this problem. If the Botox uh, does not help, then we have to wonder whether the colonic motility is the abnormality, and we do the nuclear uh, transit study, or we do colonic manometry to try and figure that out. Um, if the motility workup is abnormal, and it only involves a small segment of the colon, then sometimes we remove that abnormal segment and redo the pull through. If it's more generalized, uh, then we we do bowel management and what is uh, not in this uh, algorithm but should be is the pelvic floor physical therapy because if everything else is normal then the, the physical therapy is often helpful um, sometimes it involves uh, a, a colostomy in the worst case scenario um, sometimes it involves enemas etc so that is um, that is the obstructive symptom um, issue um, I just, just wanted to mention briefly about total colonic Hirschsprung disease because um, there is a higher risk of uh, post pull through enterocolitis and obstructive symptoms in this population. Um, again, we don't have time today to go into a lot of detail about total colonic Hirschsprung disease, but because they do have a higher uh, higher risk of having these kinds of problems, um, I know that many of the families who are watching these, uh, these webinars um, have kids with total colonic Hirschsprung disease. Um, the important message I would give to you is that just like with the more standard Hirschsprung disease, these kinds of problems, these especially these obstructive symptoms, the distension, the bloating, um, the enterocolitis, they usually get better over time. And while you're waiting for it to get better, um, it's important to make sure that there isn't an underlying cause like abnormal pathology, a mechanical obstruction, all of the things we talked about for the last 15 minutes. Um, so you have to do that work up. <clears throat> um, irrigations are very effective in kids with total colonic Hirschsprung disease. And I encourage parents to continue doing the irrigations to keep the child safe and to keep them um, relieved of their obstructive symptoms um, while they're waiting for the, the symptoms to get better. Uh, metronidazole or flagyl can be extremely helpful in kids with total colonic Hirschsprung disease. Uh, and, and I don't really know why it's so effective, but my experience over many years has been that it does help a lot with these symptoms. And I've had kids on flagyl for years in some cases um, because it's a way of waiting until they get over this on their own and avoiding another operation, which is often what people have suggested. Um, we can use Botox for kids with total colonic Hirschsprung and it, and it does help, uh, but sometimes it, it worsens the soiling problem because um, these kids don't have solid stool and it's harder for them to, to keep the stool in because the stools are more liquidy. Um, and the main thing I do for, uh, for these families is just to reassure them that um, in the vast majority of cases, um, these problems get better over time. Okay, let's talk about soiling after a pull through. There's um, basically uh, three causes for this. One is that there's poor muscle control. This picture doesn't show up very well, but it shows a sphincter that's kind of open. Um, and the, the muscle can be damaged uh, during the pull through, either by stretching or injury during the operation. In some cases, uh, a surgeon has done a sphincterotomy or a myectomy cutting the sphincter muscle, and that can interfere with muscle control. Um, the second thing you need to have normal 
continence, normal control, is you need sensation. You need to be able to sense when there's stool in the rectum and that needs to come out. And sometimes kids with Hirschsprung disease are missing that. Um, and also, if the operation has been done too low, um, then sometimes it interferes with sensation. There's the lining around what we call the dentate line, uh, which um, <clears throat> is an area just at the bottom of, of the anus um, that tells you how to differentiate stool from gas and tells you when there's stool coming down. Um, if the operation has been done too low and that, that tissue has been lost, then it makes it harder for a child to, uh, to know when there's stool that's ready to come out. And sometimes it just comes out on its own. And sometimes kids have a combination of poor muscle control and poor sensation uh, if the pull through hasn't been done as well as it could have been. So both of those things, losing muscle control and losing sensation um, are, are true physiological incontinence because you're missing the mechanisms to control the stool. But then we have um, some kids who have what we call pseudo incontinence. So they have normal muscle and they have normal sensation, um, but they're still soiling. And there's really two categories of kids like that. One is kids who, who have significant constipation. And this is a, an x-ray that shows a rectum that's huge and full of stool. Um, so those kids will, uh, there's so much stool in their rectum them that when they're not paying attention, sometimes the stool will leak out. Sometimes liquid stool will kind of percolate around a big stool ball in their rectum and, and come out. Um, so that's one form of pseudo incontinence. And then the other is, is almost the opposite. It's because it's, it's, and this is an example of a contrast in of a kid with hypermotility, which means that instead of the rectum just being there as a storage container for stool, waiting for you to have an opportunity to go to the bathroom because we've removed the rectum in kids with Hirschsprung disease. And this is the bowel from higher up that's really designed to push stool along. You've got, you've got this colon that's designed to push the stool along going right down to the anus. And sometimes kids have trouble with that hypermotile, that, that bowel that's continually pushing stool out. Now, again, all kids with Hirschsprungs who have had a pull through have their sigmoid colon or the, or the bowel that's meant to be peristalsing is down at their anus. Some kids can, can handle that without any problem. Some kids have a big, a big problem with keeping the stool in. So it is important to differentiate between kids with constipation and kids with hypermotility. And I just add as, and this is kind of obvious, but there are some kids with Hirschsprung disease who also have developmental delay. Probably the biggest category are the kids with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, but there are other conditions where uh, kids have Hirschsprungs in association with developmental delay. And of course, that can also make it harder for kids to toilet train and to, and to have fecal continence. So, how do we make the, how do we figure this out? How do we know whether a child has real incontinence or pseudo incontinence? Um, so we start by, you know, assessing the child clinically. We have them in the clinic. We take a history. We try and figure out, you know, why they're having soiling under what conditions are they having soil, soiling. And most of the time we will also examine them under anesthesia um, to, to look at that dentate line to see whether they have normal sensation to check and see how big the rectum is, often to do a rectal biopsy just to make sure that, that the pathology is normal. And then um, a contrast enema is also very helpful and particularly differentiating, like I just showed you, between the, the constipation form of pseudo-incontinence and the hyperperistalsis form. Anal rectal manometry is a way of measuring the anal sphincter, and I showed you an example of that before when we were talking about the, um, the relaxation reflex. But in kids with soiling, the main thing we're looking for on anal rectal manometry is the strength of that sphincter. So if the manometry shows that that sphincter pressure is very poor, then we know that the sphincter is not normal, and that's an explanation for why the child is soiling. They can also blow up a balloon in the rectum and ask the child when they feel it. And if the balloon is really big and the child's still not feeling it, then that tells us that there's a problem with sensation and that may be uh, contributing to the child's soiling. 
We can also do colonic manometry that I talked about before. Um, and that's very, that's a very granular, very good way of differentiating the hyperperistaltic and the hypoperistaltic or constipation uh, form of, of, um, of a pseudo incontinence. And then if the child does have the constipation form and it's not emptying properly, we have to go through the, that workup I talked about before for obstruction, make sure the pathology is fine, make sure there's no mechanical obstruction, et cetera. So how do we manage these kids? Well, it really depends on what the under, underlying problem is. And so if it's true incontinence, so a problem with the, the sphincter muscles abnormal or the sensations abnormal or both, then we try and keep the kids a little bit constipated using a diet and loperamide, uh, or, which is also called Imodium, to keep things from you know, coming out too loose or too quickly. And then we try and empty the rectum. Um, and you can start by using laxatives, uh, stimulant laxatives, which are things like Senna or Isocodal or Dulcolax. Um, and so that those stimulant laxatives are given, the rectum can empty, and then there's no soiling. Um, but many kids who have true incontinence, abnormal muscle or abnormal sensation, a lot of them need the rectum to be emptied with enemas rather than with stimulant laxatives. Um, because the theory is if the rectum is empty, then you're not going to have soiling. Um, so that can be, enemas can be given from below, or they can be given using uh, a mace or a secostomy by putting fluid into the upper part of the colon and washing the colon out once a day. Um, and in some cases, the, the best option is a colostomy for kids like this. If um, this is a child who has normal sphincters and normal sensation, so they're, they have the capacity for continence, and their problem is that they have a, a huge rectum that's full of stool, then we have to, as I said before, treat any causes for that obstruction. Um, they need to be on a toilet routine. They need to sit on a regular basis. High fiber diet, um, passive laxatives like, like uh, Miralax, which is the most commonly used one, plus stimulant laxatives to make sure that they get empty. Um, we tend not to use enemas from below in these kids because a lot of time there is stool holding behavior and the enemas from below will make that worse. Um, and the biofeedback training and pelvic floor physical therapy, I think are extremely important. I'm going through this pretty fast because um, we've done other sessions on bowel management and I don't have time to go into a lot of those details today. If it's hyperperistalsis, the opposite of the constipation one, then you have to take an opposite approach. So we give them a diet that is a constipating diet to try and slow things down. Um, sugars, sugary drinks, applesauce, that sort of stuff, um, and sometimes lactose um, and sometimes gluten um, will potentiate this problem. So we, we tend to um, try and avoid those things. Um, toileting routine is normal. Uh, it, or is important, um, using Miralax or laxatives is, is harmful in these kids. Um, a lot of times we'll see a child who has soiling from hyperperistalsis and they've been put on Miralax and we basically stop the Miralax and that solves their soiling problem. So this is not a situation in which laxatives and Miralax are, are helpful. Um, we'll often slow the bowels down with loperamide. There's a thing called eosinophilic colitis that can sometimes cause this hyperperistalsis. And so that needs to be looked for by a gastroenterologist. Uh, sometimes metronidazole or probiotics can help with this. And because they have hyperperistalsis and they're stooling all the time, we have to protect their perianal skin. Um, so, and this is basically the algorithm for the soiling, which I, um, which I've just gone through. So I'm not gonna, I wanna leave time for questions. So maybe I won't go through this in detail, but it'll be available to you if, if you need it. So in summary, uh, most children with Hirschsprungs do very well after surgery. That's, that's a really important point that I wanna emphasize. And even kids who have problems in the early period, the first couple of years after their pull through, most of them will eventually get over those problems and have an excellent outcome later on. And uh, if a child does have obstructive symptoms or soiling or both, um, the most 
effective management is going to be based on a clear understanding of what the underlying problem is. And so it needs to be an organized approach to, uh, to get you to a solution. Okay. I'm ready for questions. Okay. Unable to start. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Langer. That was um, awesome. So thank you. We have some questions lined up here. I can read them out. If a child continues to have enterocolitis inflammation complications after the Duhamel procedure, past the age of six, could it be caused by stool staying in the section without ganglion cells that remains and causing recurring infection? If yes, is there an option to go back in and do the Swenson method? Yeah, so so that's it's a good question because um, there there is more of a reservoir uh, in the Duhamel operation. There's uh, because you've got still got that native rectum there. The vast majority of kids um, after a Duhamel, whether it's done for the standard Hirschsprung's disease um, or whether it's done for total colonic Hirschsprung disease, because there's just to digress for a second. Um, for kids with total colonic Hirschsprung, there is quite a controversy about whether the better operation is the Swenson or Suave, um, or whether a Duhamel is better. I personally uh, prefer the Duhamel because it does have that better storage capacity. But at, whenever there's better storage capacity, there's also perhaps a, a, a possibility of stasis or kind of stool just kind of sitting there and the bacteria getting overgrown in it. And I think that's what the question is is getting at. In yeah. kids with um, with standard shorter segment Hirschsprung disease, you know, if you look at the long term outcomes, the vast majority of kids having had a Duhamel are not having enterocolitis at age six. Um, if it's total colonic, then the risks are somewhat higher. But, uh, you know, my experience, because I've done many Duhamels for total colonic, that's the, that was my preferred operation. Um, the vast majority at age six, even with total colonic, are, are not having ongoing enterocolitis problems. So, so that takes me to, okay, maybe there's some other underlying problem in this particular child. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think before redoing the pull through, removing the Duhamel and making it into a Swenson, um, I would want to make sure that there isn't some other correctable problem. So I would do, and that's, this will be a nice little review of what I just talked about. So I would do um, a rectal exam, usually under anesthesia in a six-year-old, and, um, and, and make sure there's no narrowing, do a contrast enema, make sure there's nothing that there's no narrowing, make sure there's no big spur like that one I showed you where the stool is just sitting there and, and uh, festering. Um, because those are things that potentially could be corrected without having to redo the whole pull through. I would do a rectal biopsy while I had the child asleep for that examination under anesthesia to make sure that the bowel that's been pulled down has normal ganglion cells, right? Um, and, and I would probably do, if those were normal, I would probably do motility testing also, because if the colon has abnormal motility, that could be the cause of your um, ongoing enterocolitis. And to go do a big operation to remove the Duhamel and convert it to a Swenson, if the colonic motility is abnormal, you're still gonna have a child that's sick. So I think it's important to like, do the complete workup. Now, there have been certainly kids who have had that workup where everything seems to be checking out and they're still having ongoing enterocolitis. And in those kids, yeah, I think the it, it is worth redoing the pull through and uh, converting it to a Swenson. And certainly there are there are lots of kids where that has been helpful. But it's but don't underestimate um, how how difficult that operation can be. You know, um, there are. There are lots of redo uh, operations done, but um, most pediatric surgeons are not doing very many redos, mm -hmm. and, and especially converting from a Duhamel to a Swenson because of those staple lines, uh, everything gets pretty stuck, and that can be a tough operation. So before you engage in that, I would say make sure you do the complete workup and make sure it's the right thing to do. And then if you are going to have that done, make sure it's being done by somebody who's got a lot of experience with redo Hirschsprung surgery. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Langer. The next question is, what do we do if the surgeon does not do a contrast enema and goes straight to Botox? Uh, what should you do? Well, I guess the first thing is to see how the Botox works, right? Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, if the, if the Botox helps a lot, then, okay, you know, that's the diagnostic test and, and uh, you, I would just probably carry on and, and not worry about it. The truth is that most, this is again from experience, uh, the most kids who have obstructive symptoms after their pull through have had a good pull through. There isn't any stricture, there isn't any mechanical problem or twists or whatever. And the pathology is usually normal. So most of those kids are, the next step would be giving them Botox anyway. So, you know, I think it wouldn't be the, I would kind of start from the top and move down, but if, if a surgeon decides, okay, let's try Botox as the first step and then it helps, great, you know, yeah. then let's go with it. Okay, excellent, thank you. Next question, have you or your colleagues had much experience with children around the age of six who have had success with pelvic floor physical therapy? I'm curious if they can typically understand the therapy at that age, or for lack of a better word, listen to the therapist and do what they've, they're told to do in order to fix the stool holding behavior or learn to take the proper time to get all of the stool out. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And I think we're learning more every year about pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, you know, when when I, when we wrote those papers, I, I showed you those algorithms, um, you know, we didn't even put pelvic floor th physical therapy in there. And that was in the like 2017 or something. So not that long ago. Right. Um, so uh, we're, we are continuing to learn. Um, pelvic, floor phys pelvic floor physical therapy is, um, is not it's it's not like saying okay this is an operation and these are the steps and boom 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 it there are lots of different things that that physical therapists do when they're doing pelvic floor um, the most common reason for somebody to have pelvic floor physical therapy is women who have had multiple pregnancies and their pelvic floor is kind of weak from that and they're having problems with soiling and they need to strengthen their pelvic floor so if you just go to the average pelvic floor physical therapist, you know, in a clinic on, in your town, uh, that's where their experience is. But that's not what most Hirschsprung's kids need. What most Hirschsprung's kids need is the opposite. They need to learn how to relax their pelvic floor muscles while they're passing and coordinate the, the passage of stool. So um, there, there now are many centers that where the pediatric pelvic floor physical therapists um, have gotten very active and they've, and they're very, very good. And they do a lot of stuff. They, they teach them relaxation. It's not just about pooping. It's, it's how you're yeah. sitting. It's, it's how you're relaxing your whole body. Um, they use things like, you know, yoga techniques. And the, so there, there, there's a lot that everybody is, is learning. So, um, I, and I haven't answered your question, but I will, um, I think number one thing is to try and find pediatric pelvic floor physical therapists that know what they're doing. And then in terms of age, I, what I'm hearing is around age five uh, is when kids can start to um, cooperate and figure out and, and understand the concepts. But of course, every kid is different, right? So there's probably going to be some four-year-olds who do fine, and there's going to be some eight-year-olds that are still off the wall and, and, and won't focus. Um, I think at age six, it is worth a try, but again, I would, mm -hmm. I would, um, I would try and find a pelvic floor physical therapy unit that is experienced with children and make sure that they understand the goal of what you're doing, that it's not, this is not somebody who's having soiling, who, who just needs to strengthen their pelvic floor. This is a completely different situation. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question is, what is the ultimate goal for an HD child in terms of stooling per day? You mean numbers of times? I guess that's that's what the question that's is. The question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, again, every child is different. Um, and in general, I would like to see every Hirschsprung's kid stooling at least once a day. Um, and 
but it's not about just about how often you're stooling. It's about how well you're emptying the rectum because that's going to a complete emptying of the rectum is the goal. And if you have complete emptying of the rectum, then you won't have soiling because there's nothing to come out. Um, and you won't have backup with distension of that rectum and that colon. So, so that's the goal. Now, there are some kids, you know, you've lost some of your colon when you have Hirschsprung disease. So once a day may not be, you know, realistic for some kids, their stools are a bit looser if they've only got half their colon, let's say, or if certainly if they're a total colonic kid, they're not going to only be stooling once a day in most cases. So it really depends on their anatomy. Um, and it's not even, it's not really so much about how often are they stooling? It's about how well are they emptying their rectum? Perfect, thank you. Next question is, should the child who still struggles with constipation follow a special diet after surgery? Yeah, I think diet's really important. And I think we, we've had at least one of these webinars, maybe two, um, specifically about diet. Um, so I, I do think it's important. And I think fiber is, for most kids with Hirschsprung, uh, short segment Hirschsprung, um, fiber is really helpful. And di mm -hmm. dietary fiber is, you know, the best way to get um, to get fiber. But sometimes you can supplement it with uh, there's there's soluble fiber like Metamucil. There's uh, insoluble fiber as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a matter of figuring out what is the best thing for your child. The idea is to keep the stools bulky so that they don't they don't leak out, but not too hard. They should be soft and bulky. And fiber is very good at that. Um, so I think so. I think the answer is is yes. Now in kids with total colonic Hirschsprungs, maybe not as much mm -hmm. because there you you maybe are trying to slow things down a little bit more. And uh, and fiber really is most helpful in the colon. If you don't have a colon, then fiber may may actually make things worse. So again, it's a it's an individualized thing. And then diet is not only about fiber; it's also about things like sugar. And, it, and making sure that if they have a you know a gluten sensitivity that you avoid that or lactose intolerance or all of those kinds of things, working with a, a good dietitian can be extremely helpful for these kids. Right, and just to your point on our website, we've had um, posted all of the previous YouTube's uh, coffee conversations, and we have definitely have I think there's two with dietary uh, recommendations for Hirschsprung's right. kids there. For those of you who are following. Uh, next question is, first, thank you for coming on and giving this education session. I really appreciate it. How old do you start the kids on laxatives? My little one is 18 months old. Is that too young for laxatives? She has both obstructive and soiling issues. Right. So let's let's first start by defining what we mean by laxatives. Um, uh, there are really two categories of what people call laxatives. The first is really stool softeners. Um, and the most common one of those is uh, Miralax or PEG. PEG 3350 is the, is the medical term for it. And, and what those, those are called laxatives by many people. Um, in Canada, it's called Restorilax. So they even have a Miralax. I mean, that's got the lax in there. So they mm -hmm. make people think it's a laxative. Um, what it does is it softens the stool. And the more you take, the more loose the stool is. So it, it can be helpful in kids who have a tendency towards hard stools because you want the stools to be soft enough that you can pass them without pain. Um, and fiber is good for that, as we just said, but Miralax can be very helpful for that as well. Um, but uh, in a child who's having soiling, and you know, I don't, I'd have to, we'd have to kind of do, do with your 18, month old child, we'd have to go through the the whole algorithm that we just talked about for obstructive symptoms and for soiling to try and figure out exactly what's the underlying cause. But many kids who are, who have soiling, especially if it's hyperperistaltic type, um, are going to do worse with a stool softener like Miralax. So, um, and and you can start Miralax really at any at any age. You know, we we tend probably tend not to use it below a year of age, but um, but I, I'm not sure that there's a reason why you couldn't give it earlier. The other kind of laxatives are stimulant laxatives, and that's basically Senna or Bisacodyl, which is also called Dulcolax. <clears throat> and those stimulate 
the bowel to empty it. They, they increase peristalsis. They allow the child to push the stool out better. Um, and so for a, a child with hyperperistalsis also, you know, stimulating their colon to empty better is that's the opposite of what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. But in kids who have either stool holding or they have a non-relaxing sphincter that they're having trouble getting over, or they've just been, you know, they've just got a slow motility. Um, all, all of those kinds of kids will do well with stimulant laxatives. Um, and you can, you know, again, we usually don't use Senna or stimulant laxatives much below a year of age, but I think starting at a year and a half, I think it would be reasonable to try that. Um, and and again, uh, before we just start throwing laxatives at kids, I think we really are obligated to know what the underlying problem is that we're treating and make mm -hmm. sure we're using them appropriately. Right, okay. And the next question is about dairy. This one comes up quite often, I find. In your opinion, is dairy bad for HD kids? Yeah, so again, it's um, each child is, is an individual. Um, some kids who have who have lactose intolerance, yeah, dairy is bad for them. Um, if they have a, a milk protein allergy, sometimes that causes a kind of inflammation in the in the gut, and that can also be bad for them. Um, and there are ways of testing for these. A gastroenterologist um, can can do the appropriate tests to to try and figure out if your child has a specific problem with with dairy products. Um, in general. I tell families that there's nothing wrong with, with dairy products for kids with Hirschsprungs. In some children, um, dairy products actually make them a little more constipated. Um, and if that's a child who has a tendency towards constipation, then that, that can be a problem for that child. So, you know, you might want to lay off on the dairy. Um, uh, but there's many kids who tolerate milk and, and cheese and all the dairy products fine with, with no issues. And so... Um, I, I I don't think you can generalize uh, on that question. It has to be individualized. Okay. Next question is, is a dilation under anesthesia works the same as Botox? Yeah, so that's a that's a, a good question. There's um, there's several reasons why you would want to dilate a child under anesthesia. One is if they actually have a stricture. Right, so if there's scar tissue there, usually from the surgery, from the healing after the surgery, and it's not necessarily an operation that wasn't done properly. It's sometimes this happens uh, as the child heals. Uh, there's scar tissue that narrows the opening down, and um, it, that's one one of the reasons to dilate under anesthesia, um, and that's not the same as Botox because Botox is relaxing the muscle, so. Uh, the, the, there's a specific re if there's a specific reason to dilate a stricture, and sometimes we inject some steroid into the stricture as well at the time of the dilating, which tends to help keep it open a little bit better. Um, there are some times where there is no stricture, and um, you know we're going to put a child to sleep to um, maybe do a rectal biopsy, or we're worried about something, and, and we have to dilate the sphincter to do that. Um, that does work similarly to Botox. Uh, Botox is, a, and, and sometimes we used to do that before Botox, we sometimes would do that. We would just go and dilate the sphincter and, and, it, and it often helped, um, but it was less controlled than giving Botox. When we give Botox, we're specifically putting it into the sphincter. We give a certain dose, we, we, have, we know what to expect in terms of uh, the relaxation of that sphincter. So I think most people nowadays, if they want to relax the sphincter in a child like this, will use Botox rather than just simply dilate it. Okay, great, thank you. Next question. My son is three and was potty trained. We receive Botox every three months at this point. After two months, it seems that he experiences obstructions more commonly. We currently do irrigations when this happens once or twice a day. Could this be causing him harm, make him want to be withholding? We also give him Restorelax when he is backed up. Yeah, so that's what you're describing is a common scenario. Um, and if the Botox is working for the, for the two months, um, 
again, it's, I said three months, but it's, each kid is different. And sometimes it's two months, sometimes it's four to six months. Um, I, I think in that situation, what you're doing is the correct thing because he's only three and it often takes till they're five before they sort of grow out of this problem and you can kind of back away from the Botox. And irrigating in between is good. You're, you're protecting your child from getting enterocolitis. And most kids where it makes them feel better are quite happy to accept it. They don't, it doesn't cause more stool holding in most kids. Now that's not all, some kids just say, forget it. I'm not, I don't want irrigations. And, and then you have to go down a different pathway. The, the only thing I would say is that it's important to make sure that you've ruled out the other co potential causes for obstructive symptoms because um, the Botox might be working, but there might be something else on top of that that uh, is also correctable that that uh, you need to think about, like a stricture, like um, a twist or, you know, something something else like that or, or like um, uh, abnormal pathology. So, but as, assuming if your if your doctor has done the appropriate workup and and has settled on the sphincter being the main problem, which, as I said, is the most common scenario, mm -hmm. um, then I think what you're doing is is entirely appropriate. Okay, great. Next question is: My son had a suave pull through at three months of age. At almost three years of age, he began having issues with bowel movements, and with a rectal exam, he was cleared of issues. We've been told to keep him on Restorelax, which has helped him empty more stool at once. But what is the likely likelihood he'll gain dependency on Restorelax for bowel movements being on it for a long period of time? Is there something else we should be testing him for? And is this something he will outgrow? Yeah, so uh, there's sev several questions uh, nested in that question. So the, the first thing um, is, that, and I would go back to, you know, the the my first and last slide, which is you have to understand the under uh, the underlying problem. So he's had a rectal exam, which is great, means there's no stricture at the bottom. Um, but we don't know for sure if there's something maybe higher up that uh, could be contributing. So a contrast enema would be helpful. Um, I don't, you didn't say whether he's had a rectal biopsy to make sure that the pathology is normal because if he if if he's got a transition zone pull through or something like that, um, then that may need to be addressed. Um, and um, so that other testing that was that's the answer to that. I think you do need to go down that algorithm and make sure that that you've ruled out any of the other problems. Um, if the if the Miralax is is helping then there's no reason not to continue it. There's uh, Kids don't develop a, um, a dependency on Miralax. Miralax is just a, it's a molecule that draws fluid into the, into the colon um, from, from the colon wall. It, it doesn't get absorbed into the colon. It doesn't cause stimulation of the colon. It's basically just a stool softener and it doesn't, um, it's not habit forming. And we've, and there are some people who are on, peg for their whole life and that's and that's not a problem you're, you're not doing any harm by giving it to him um so i was there a third question in there in that question um yeah she also wanted to add that at one and a half years he did have botox and it worked but at three years now he got it it doesn't work so they were told to stay on restore relax yeah so you know what what sometimes happens is that the child does have a problem with, they all have non-relaxation of the sphincter, but the child is having a problem overcoming that non-relaxing sphincter and the Botox will help them with that. Once a child gets to three or four, if they have either new, new obstructive symptoms or obstructive symptoms that, that are not getting better, um, a lot of times we're talking about uh, stool holding behavior having developed. And that, that may be what's going on here. He's probably too young for pelvic floor physical therapy, but if the Restorlax is kind of keeping him empty and avoiding soiling and avoiding obstructive symptoms, then I would just continue it for, for a while. The best case scenario is by the time he's five, he will be better. The worst case scenario is by the time he's five, he's still having ongoing issues. And at that point, he may be a candidate for pelvic floor physical therapy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the best solution for better food absorption? 
Um, that I mean, that's that's a tough one because it again is very individual, and I would apply the same um, philosophy that I uh, that I was talking about with respect to obstructive symptoms and to soiling. In order to solve a problem of of uh, nutrient absorption, you have to understand clearly what the cause of that problem is, and there there are many many different potential causes um, that are mostly unrelated to the fact that the child has Hirschsprung disease, um, and that should be worked up by a pediatric gastroenterologist. Okay, great, thank you. The next one is, are you aware of any testing currently underway regarding sphincter reconstruction to help with soiling and incontinence issues? Um, there is, I mean, there are lots of different um, sphincter reconstruction methods that, that have been developed in the adult population. Um, and most of them are not that effective. You know, even, even things like artificial sphincters that have been worked on or using muscles from the leg to create a new sphincter. Most of those have, well, I'd say all of those have never really been applied uh, to the to the Hirschsprung's population. There is there is a, a procedure that Dr. Levitt um, has has talked about in the last few years, which is really a kind of redoing the pull through, but um, tightening up the the muscles around the rectum at the time that's done. And and he's had some very promising um, outcomes from that. The problem is that we don't don't really have long term data. So you know there have been lots of operations in the past, not not necessarily for Hirschsprung's, but for, for all kinds of things where you had great outcomes in the first year, but then, you know, three years later, five years later, it's like back to where you started. So um, I think it's too early to say uh, whether that is going to be the answer, but, uh, but, but there, there may be hope on the horizon on that one. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Langer. Is it better to have the child go to the washroom after every meal or more, even if they don't want to, to make sure they are emptying, or is it better to let them go when they feel it? which may give a bigger bowel movement versus a bunch of little ones every time we try to make them go. Yeah, so I I think routines are really helpful for children who are going through toilet training with or without Hirschsprung disease, but particularly for kids who are having a problem with their emptying. Um, I do think that regular sitting on the toilet is is really helpful. And I usually suggest after each meal and before bed. Um, and they don't necessarily go every single time, but the, you have to go back to what, what is the goal of the exercise? And the goal of the exercise is to keep their rectum empty. And uh, if you are accomplishing that with, let's say, four smaller bowel movements a day, then great. <laughs> That's the goal. There's no one right way to do it. Um, the, the downside of just waiting until they say they, they need to go is a lot of kids that age, you know, they're playing in uh, at the playground with their friends and they feel, oh, I got to go, but this is way more fun than going sitting on the toilet. So they just ignore it. Um, or some kids, as as I mentioned in the in the little presentation, that some kids don't have normal sensation. So they may actually have a full rectum and not even realize that it's a full rectum. So all things considered, you know, my philosophy has been you're going to accomplish your goal better, goal being to empty the rectum all the time. Um, by doing routine sitting on the toilet. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question is, do these patients with short segment HD who underwent surgery and continue to have problems with obstruction or constipation improve these symptoms in adult life? Yeah, most of them are, are getting significantly better by the time they're four or five years old. If you look at the, you know, the long-term data in, in teenagers and young adults, um, the vast majority of people with Hirschsprung disease are living a normal life with uh, without these kinds of problems. Are they perfect? Not necessarily. Um, if you go into the you know the details of these long term uh, outcome studies, there are still some kids who or some adults who who are experiencing ongoing constipation or who have some residual bowel problems. But you know the vast majority have an excellent quality of life and and are doing really well like normal people. I remember you and Dr. Goldstein went saying that 1516 seems to be a shift, especially yeah. that you, you sort of, you know, something happens and then they kind of gain control maybe or understanding of their own bodies and therefore you see a bit of a shift at that age too. 
Right. Also, I think they, they, um, you know, their expect it's all about matching expectations to reality, right? That's what the, yeah. my definition of happiness is. You have a, a match between your expectations and your reality. Right. <laughs> I think that kids, once they get to that age, they, you know, they, they live with what they have, just like we all have to live with certain things, whether it's, you know, pain in your knee or whatever. It's a, right. and for them, it may be, it may be more bowel related. And I think it's also worth um, mentioning that the reach, one of the things that reach is now doing is creating a, a community for um, late teenagers and young adults who have had her strong disease, um, which I think is going to be very helpful for many of many of these people. For sure. Definitely. Okay, next question. My daughter is seven years old. Recently, I've learned to do her detoxing massages on her tummy. Is it safe to keep doing that? Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about. Um, I don't know much about detoxing uh, mas stomach massage, but I have had patients who have gone to practitioners who have taught them these techniques, and in many cases, it's really helpful for them. So. Yes. Just because I don't understand something doesn't mean it's not valid or useful. Right. Um, I can't imagine that it would be harmful, right. but I'm probably not the expert to to answer that question with any you know validity. Right. I certainly have seen it myself with um, babies, especially infants, and I think that um, you know I think a doctor once described it as doing ILUs, their I love use, and doing it around right. the tummy, and it seemed to right. cause some gas to move anyway so I, i've witnessed that <laughs> yeah yeah no it's i think there's there's so many things that that we in the medical community don't really understand um right. and it would be you know that's for the next generation to uh to investigate and prove that they that's work right <laughs> okay we've got two more questions and that's what we'll have time for so Next one is, do you think there is potential for research in the future around full bowel transplant the way we do a non-functioning kidney for example um, yeah, so it's there. There has been lots of research done into intestinal transplantation. Um, the 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 use of transplantation of any organ is is meant to um, is meant to replace an organ that is required for normal life, right? And so kidneys, um, hearts, livers, pancreas. I mean, these these things have all been transplanted, uh, and small bowel. You, you can't live a normal life without your small bowel. That's what how you absorb your nutrients. Uh, so people who have lost their entire small bowel or the vast majority of their small bowel are candidates for a small bowel transplant. And there's a very small subgroup of Hirschsprung's patients whose, whose Hirschsprung disease, the absence of these ganglion cells, involves all or most of their small bowel as well as their colon. Um, and, and many of those patients have had small bowel transplants. If you look at the series of pediatric small bowel transplants in the literature, um, total intestinal Hirschsprung disease is one of the categories of, of kids who have gotten those. You can live a normal life without your colon. So nobody has really looked at colon transporta uh, transplantation because the risks of transplantation, the immunologic problems, the technical problems, the the um, immunosuppressants you need to take, which increase your risk of infections and other problems, um, are not worth trying to, you know, create a, a colon. Um, there are many, many people out there who have lived a normal life without a colon. Um, sometimes they need a, you know, an ileostomy permanently, and you know, people with ulcerative colitis, familial polyposis. There's lots of diseases where you you lose your colon, <clears throat> and um, so, so that's why nobody has has really pursued uh, colon transportation, uh, transplantation as as an option. Okay, great, thank you. Last question is: My son is thirteen and still soiling due to hypermotility. I suggested enemas to his doctor. However, I was told this would not assist the soiling. My question is: Would enemas be helpful for my child? Um, you know, I think. Um, I, my experience has been that, that most people with um, Hirschsprungs and hypermotility uh, respond well to the things I mentioned before, such as uh, Imodium, constipating diet, that kind of thing. There are some where it's just, you know, where it just can't be, it can't, can't get on top of it. 
Um, and enemas are from below, so rectal enemas, um, can be helpful for short periods of time. But the problem is, you know, you, you empty. They only get up into the, you know, the rectum and the sigmoid colon. And, and you know, if you've got hypermotility, then that fills up again pretty quickly. Um, what can be more effective would be anti-grade enemas, which is a, either a mace or a cecostomy putting access a tube into the cecum and then washing the entire colon out. So now you've got the whole entire colon, which is empty, and then you combine that with the slowing down of the colon with the emodium and, and the diet. And um, we have had some kids who have done better with less soiling um, with anti-grade enemas. So I, I don't think you can make generalizations. It's an, it's an individual thing. Um, but it's, it's, I would say, you know, that I wouldn't rule it out completely okay. uh, for that particular situation. Thank you. And one last thing I just want to touch on and ask you um, is one thing that we're seeing is more hospitals that are including bowel management clinics. And at REACH, we're big fan of promoting this to families and parents because it's knowledgeable people with the resources to sort of follow that algorithm or steps that you referred to. We know it's not in all hospitals. We know that not all doctors are aware of it, but would you agree that if there is one in the area, maybe seeking sort of that bowel management clinic is a great thing for Hirschsprung's kids because obvious reasons, everything you spoke about, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And this is, you know, it's like many, it's like many diseases um, where a, a team of a multidisciplinary team of people, which could, in this case would involve surgeons, gastroenterologists, dietitians, social workers, um, you know, and and most importantly, the nurses. Yes. Um, the the multidisciplinary teams are associated with improved outcomes for many many things. We see this with cystic fibrosis, with the management of cystic fibrosis, the management yeah. of diabetes management of obesity like there there are lots and lots of examples and there there are now data out there for bowel management as well that multidisciplinary teams people focused on this problem who come from all different kind of backgrounds and all work together um, that you're going to have better outcomes than if it's just one person in an office who's trying to manage the whole thing right Excellent. Thank you. I always try to get that in there for families because yeah. I know I've been watching success rate and I know certainly our panel of doctors was always talking about that. So, okay. Well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Langer, for sharing your time and your wisdom. Um, we are also, I know I speak for the entire community, so grateful. No problem. It's my pleasure. Have a thank great so day. Have a great day. Bye-bye.